Hello and welcome everyone at uh, this uh, fourth press conference of the day here at the World Economic Forum on ASEAN in Vietnam. Right now we'll be looking at the future of ASEAN or as it's announced in the press conference schedule of, uh, ASEAN at a tipping point. And the reason why we are looking at ASEAN as being on a tipping point is because what we've seen in the last uh, 50 years is that ASEAN has grown to become the sixth largest economy worldwide. But what got it here won't get it to the next phase. That's a major finding of a PwC report that has been prepared uh, by uh, the guest speakers of today, uh, namely uh, Dinti Quinvan, senior partner at PwC here in Vietnam, and David Wijratne, uh, the partner leader of the uh, Growth Markets Center of PwC in Singapore, and an author of the study on a future of ASEAN. Welcome uh, to both of you. Okay, with that, and without further ado, I'd like to ask uh, David uh, to uh, bring us up to speed. Uh, David, uh, so ASEAN has grown to the sixth largest economy, but the assertion is uh, in order to grow, continue to grow further, uh, it will have to come up with innovative strategies in which the private sector plays a, uh, a big role. Could you tell us a little, a little bit more about that? Vietnam and the World Economic Forum for hosting this year's summit in Hanoi. I think it's been a tremendous event so far. Um, yes, you're right, Pierre. As, as many people know, last year marked the 50th anniversary of ASEAN, which was a tremendous uh, achievement given the first 50 years of the 20th century and what characterized ASEAN as it overcame poverty and a great deal of conflict. Now, as you rightly say, it is the sixth largest economy in the world. It's, it's touted to be the fourth largest by 2030. It has a GDP of $2.75 trillion and is the fourth largest trading region uh, uh, in the world, you know, accounting for about 7% of, of global exports. You know, Asian's growth has been predominantly founded upon its people. First and foremost, it orients its tremendous labor force. And that has then led to, you know, rising incomes, the creation of emerging middle class, larger consumption, which has driven an economy supported by you know, some, some well-managed government debt, at least comparison, in comparison to other emerging markets, and a buildup of foreign reserves. So all of that has actually positioned ASEAN to be the fourth largest or fourth most attractive foreign investment destination globally, and second behind China in the region. But against that backdrop, there are a number of challenges for the next, not only 50 years, but the next five years for ASEAN. And these challenges are both external to the region and within the region. You know, so, so externally, you know, given that ASEAN uh, is a dependent, 75% of its exports are based on trade outside of the region. Now, if you take that in the context of a declining uh, global tr trade downward trend since 2012, um, China's economic, planned economic slowdown and potential trade war uh, that we're seeing between China and the US, ASEAN is very uh, susceptible to, to outside forces from an external trade perspective. And then in addition to that, you take the fourth industrial revolution. And what has been discussed here in the next three, you know, these three days is that, at least in the near term, the fourth industrial revolution will bring some amount of, 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 of pain, um, and namely in, in, in the form of unemployment in that regard. You know, whether that is due to production and services being reshored closer to demand or the adoption of AI within the region, you know, near-term unemployment is a threat leading to social unrest, leading to a drop in consumption. These are challenges to the region from an external perspective. Internally, Productivity is the number one challenge to the region. You, you're seeing that as the, as the region moves up from being a low, uh, co a, a low cost labor uh, market and the manufacturing hub of the world moving up to more value adding services, productivity is a real challenge uh, to the region. In addition to well-known challenges around infrastructure and institutional reforms. So with all that as, as a sort of context, 
you know, we, we, we have uh, presented a perspective as to what does Agen have to do going forward to ensure continued growth? What proactive measures uh, should it take for three key stakeholders? And so the first stakeholder group is the ASEAN Secretariat itself, so the community of nations. And one of the key recommendations that we're making is that this group really should be focused on that first challenge of, of dependency on external trade. You know, so what can the ASEAN community, ASEAN uh, Secretariat do to facilitate internal trade? So focusing on you know, uh, uh, trade barriers, but in particular, technical trade barriers. You know, these are things that are not just uh, uh, challenges to ASEAN. Earlier in the week, you'll have seen the US and the EU talk about technical barriers to trade. You know, so this is, this is a, a, a challenge that, that even developed economies focus upon. But harmonizing that will create a more fluent and, and fluid internal economy uh, uh, from a trade perspective within ASEAN. Um, our second group of, of, of stakeholders are the, the, the countries themselves. And as you know, you know, ASEAN is uh, quite a wide diaspora of nations and at different stages of an economic journey. And so the way that we looked at this was taking their economic uh, uh, current position and their demographic transition and creating five categories, which was slightly uh, innovative. So the first category being those were aging uh, high income groups. So you know, that is Singapore and Brunei. And they're facing challenges around an aging workforce low uh, uh, a reduction uh, uh, an aging population a reduction in, in in the workforce and therefore a challenge on funding those people that are coming out of the workforce but with fewer people to fund that so productivity being a key challenge and how can they adopt measures in ict and skilling and innovation to basically do more with with fewer people the second group are the aging middle income so that those are, are countries such as Malaysia and Thailand. Now, these countries have traditionally you know, leveraged their low labor cost wages to attract investment and generate goods. But now, as these wages increase, the demand will be for uh, them to produce better, more value-adding goods and services. You have to, if you're gonna demand more, you know, higher wages, you've gotta create something of, of higher value. So they have to move up the value chain and create an environment, both from a skills perspective and a capability perspective, to, to, to re, re, you know, justify those higher wages. And then the third group, the third category, is actually a category of one, and that is of Vietnam, which is an aging low-income group. And you know, Quinn Van will talk a bit about that later on. But in that regard, you know, how can Vietnam manage its, its workforce to ensure that more women come into the economy, more, more, more uh, older people stay in the workforce, whilst also taking advantage of the digital economy to foster uh, greater services and, and growth. Now, on the other side, you have the younger economies. Now, that is, they, they really make up what, what a lot of people talk about, the young demographic in ASEAN. And so if you talk about the, the younger middle income, you're talking about countries such as Indonesia and the Philippines, you know, large economies. So you've got large economies, you need to create jobs. That is the, 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 the key challenge to Indonesia and the Philippines, is to create a lot of jobs, but also quality jobs. But you can't just rely on corporations and state-owned enterprise to create these jobs. You need to foster an environment for entrepreneurship. So families and friends, communities come together and actually create their own businesses to facilitate growth themselves. You can't just depend on uh, 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 the, the private corporations, say on enterprises, to create the, these jobs. And then the final category are those, uh, the younger demographic, lower income. So those are the countries such as Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, which do have a bit longer. They've got a bit of time because of the younger demographic that they have, but they've got a longer journey to go. They've got, longer, they've got a bit more to do on their institutional form. So they have to try and attract foreign investment, maybe some of the lower value work that Thailand and Malaysia are relinquishing, that China's relinquishing, to create a foundation of that economy, which will then fuel the, uh, provide uh, incomes for families to take their children to then have the skills to create more value adding uh, services and products in, in the next generation of the economy. So that sort of sets a scene that, that you know, whilst people talk of ASEAN as one region, it is actually quite there is a large just diaspora in that economy, and companies have to really understand how they, when they look at a regional operating model, how to place themselves across those 10 markets. 
So if you've got the secretariat, you've got the individual uh, countries uh, playing their roles, corporations also have a key role to play in taking the Asian economy forward. And from our report, we looked at seven key sectors being the automotive industry, uh, consumer banking, consumer goods, medical devices, refined fuels, transportation, telecoms, and medical devices. And what we looked at there, there were three key themes for future strategies of growth. First being more localized economies, more localized businesses. So if you take the automotive industry, for example, and you know, even companies in Japan are beginning to do this, they are trying to create more of their operating model within, the, within Asia or within Thailand in this example. So not only just doing semi-assemble, but actually sourcing locally, local R&D, local manufacturing, and then local and regional, and then out of Asia distribution. So actually putting more of your business into Asia and sourcing from Asia from that. The second key strategy is around a more holistic digital operating model. We've heard a lot the last couple of days about the power of digital in reaching consumers through e-payments and mobile banking, mobile commerce. That is a lot of top line growth. How do you reach consumers? And the consumer goods companies have a tremendous opportunity here. They can reach for once and for all direct to their, their, their consumer base and generate loyalty. But if you look at the other end of the operating model, digital capabilities can really help transform a business and become more efficient, not only in their supplier, supplier base management by using technology such as blockchain, but also within the manufacturing and warehousing part of, of, of a consumer goods business. So it's looking at applying digital capabilities in a more holistic perspective, rather than just looking at it from a sales and marketing perspective, like a top line growth, really looking at it from a holistic perspective. And then finally, the third key theme uh, for Azure and growth for corporates is around partnerships and alliances. Now we're seeing convergence within sectors, but a lot of companies are still re uh, relatively reluctant to break down the barriers and partner with companies from other sectors or even within their sector. And yet, that is a key element for growth. If you take one example, such as transportation, the aviation industry, you know, full service carriers in this region face quite a challenging time on the mid haul routes. So going from Singapore to Bangkok, Bangkok up to Chiang Mai. Partly because there are a number of low cost airlines around, but also regulations prohibit the hub to first city going on to the second city, second city being Chiang Mai. So how do you overcome that? Do you just come out of the market or do you pursue with it with more of a, an, an aligned strategy? So one learning from the other parts of the world you can see is how full service carriers can partner with rail and as high speed rail becomes more prolific across ASEAN, you begin to see how full service carriers can work with rail to, to create these spokes and have a further reach, increase utilization and still stay competitive. So from that perspective, the three stakeholders, the ASEAN Secretariat, the countries themselves and corporates all have a role in taking ASEAN forward but it's in a new way. It's bringing innovative strategies. It's being proactive. What grew Asian to today will not grow Asian for tomorrow. It needs a time to act in that regard. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, David, for those very comprehensive insights. Um, now, I want to turn to um, Queen Van, because, of course, we are here uh, in ASEAN, but we're also in Vietnam. Uh, and, uh, and so we want to know, of course, what, uh, what are the possibilities for Vietnam going forward? When David talked about uh, those categories of countries, uh, it, it was, um, well, perhaps not the, the most bright picture for Vietnam, uh, talking about a category of one of aging uh, societies with a lower uh, income. However, when we come here, we feel the energy, we feel the hustle and the bustle, and of course, in economic growth nowadays, uh, uh, Vietnam is, is even outpacing China, I believe, this year at about 7%. So, so in other words, uh, it, it feels like things are going well here in Vietnam. Uh, we hear from David uh, that things will have to uh, be better going forward. What uh, are the takeaways for Vietnam and what can Vietnam do or should Vietnam do and its country, uh, companies do going forward? 
Um, th thanks, Peter. And as David has said, I think one of the challenges that ASEAN have, I think Vietnam is nothing no different. Or uh, if not, that we have with my, the challenges of from both aging country and also the country which have low income. So it's all combined. So we say that we do have more challenges. You know. So look at Vietnam. Yes, over the past 10 years, we have impressive uh, GDP growth of 7%. But despite that, you look at the GDP per capita, and the GDP itself is a total, Vietnam is still in the group of the, I mean, the bottom of the ASEAN. With a population of 95 million, growing to over 100 million, aging and so on. So we have a lot of challenges to, to, to deal with. One, with a workforce of over 50 million in the workforce, so actually creating jobs for those workforce is a challenging task for the government. And looking at as David also mentioned, um, ASEAN in the next five, 10 years will be different from the ASEAN in the last 10, 15 years with all of this digital economy. Vietnam, with 22% of the workforce, is trained and skills. How are we, how Vietnam can tap into that new of the teacher? How do we really train the people? It's at almost 80% of our workforce are unskilled. So we used to live based on the growth that Vietnam have achieved over the past year. It's looking for its big market, its geographic, but also primarily would be on the low labor cost. That low labor cost is diminishing. That advantage is diminishing. And we ha if you consider ASEAN productivity is low compared with the world, Vietnam productivity is actually in the bottom half of the ASEAN, so it's very low. And that is just it's simple because we have re relied on unskilled workers. Unless we bring up the education training workforce, we are not going to really improve the productivity. So I think for Vietnam, for the government, but also for the corporates is actually how do we, what is all is surrounding to improve the productivity. That we need to focus on investment in technology, but also training training of the workforce, if the government and, and can, then the company also need to focus on that. And I think in that there's a number of companies that are successful in Vietnam, that those are the ones who actually invest in the resources, in the technology, but it's also their internal resource. So I think from a bigger picture, so that, but looking into that, if Viet, Vietnam would have to move up the chains and get into the more value added, but we cannot do that without building the skills. And building the skills takes time. It's not like technology that you invest to begin. Even if you invest in technology, you do need to have people to actually can operate it because it's all of that, it's just a tool. So, so the focus on skills uh, building. The skills buildings focus on, I think, more in terms of education, skills, skill building, trainings, but also then more investment in, in the technology part, part yep. of that. And that's, of course, a very important topic and one that we're addressing also here at the World Economic Forum on, on ASEAN is the technology aspect of all of yes, this. The technology aspect of that, I think, to, to Vietnam, beyond that is the resource yep. getting into that. Absolutely. Um, I want to give the opportunity to the audience to ask some questions. Um, uh, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. We have a microphone right there. And if you do uh, ask a question, uh, identify yourself first and then ask your question uh, immediately after. I'm having a quick look here in the audience. Um, over here in the front. Uh, and wait for the microphone. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I have a question for David. My name is Manfred. I'm from Switzerland, based in Singapore. Um, Malaysia is an interesting case. You mentioned that, right? Um, Middle-income country, sort of a candidate for the middle-income trap. What do you think of the new government uh, of Martyr's idea to promote again the automotive industry in Malaysia? Is that a good idea, or is it just falling back into the old thinking? Um, should there be a more innovative strategy? So you probably won't like the answer. I think it's. I think it's too early to test anything that Martyr is coming out at this point. You know, I think um, there is a period of. Let's just see what the journey, what journey he's going to put out there. Because just mentioning automotive, 
as an industry for growth for Malaysia. Well, what's the bigger picture? You know, how does that fit in? And I think the point I was trying to make here, and I'm going to build on Peter's point, is that economies have to look at, at all those components that are going to build one economy. So if Malaysia does want to go back to, to focusing on uh, automotive, that would be interesting. But what are, the, what are the details that build up the rest of the economy in that regard? You know, and how does that play against you know, the other players in Thailand? So I, would say I, w I won't necessarily comment too, too detailed on that because without seeing the whole economic agenda from, 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 from Malaysia at this point, it's hard to comment on just one specific element to it. You know. Very well, thank you. Let's see if there's uh, another question from the audience uh, over there. Waiting for the microphone. Uh, so hi, I'm a fan from uh, VTV. I'd like to address a question to Ms. Uh, Van about Vietnam. Uh, so uh, you've been talk. Uh, there's an, uh, this idea, this concept of a middle income trap. So I want to mention, in, in the case of Vietnam, for example, right now, Vietnam is already graduating from uh, uh, IDA, and a lot of uh, cheap ODAs or other funds are not going to be easier to, to get. So. What, how, 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 how is, um, what would be your comment on, on this, particular, this particular case of Vietnam? Yes, actually Vietnam, we just moved from the low-income to mid-income country, but it's actually still at the very beginnings of, you know, the mid-income country. So it's familiar to that. So we all, 2000, I think the mid-income country is from 2000 to, to 20,000, and we are just two, uh, two by two. Yeah, yeah. So it's very early. Um, just getting in. Um, so there is, it's a long way to go into actually we get into the to the uh, the traps. Of course, I think with all of these uh, soft loan and ODA and and, and so on, uh, it's not easy for Vietnam to get uh, the, the the funding. So clearly for companies and the government would have to look at alternative funding. But I think to me, to, from what we see, I would think that is the clever investment of uh, the effective of the investment could solve the problems because. For Vietnam, you can see how do we spend, but the particular public investment is not that effective. So to do dealing with lack of the funding, on the other hand, if we can see on how do we spend the money wisely to generate the growth, is one of the part of health, and also encourage uh, private investment. So I think it's not of the, none of the country can really looking at just uh, government funding, but the funding from the private business and other source is that is something that we can Vietnam can should leverage for the to support economic growth. And you can see you can see from the statistic, it's actually the domestic private business in Vietnam um, the, have the highest growth rate among the three sectors, state sector and FDI, and their contribution to the to the GDP growth over the over the year is also very impressive. So it's becoming is very key and and and. The, key foundations for the Vietnam economy going forward. That's how we can, how I can see it. Very well, thank you so much. And I think we have time for one more question from the audience. The question that came up uh, earlier today, uh, David, uh, is sort of the, um, uh, the question of what can you do uh, on your own versus how much are you uh, sort of a victim of what's going on in the bigger geopolitical and geoeconomic theater. Uh, and of course, as you mentioned, uh, the ASEAN uh, exports are very dependent on, uh, on the bigger uh, world, let's say, out there. So what uh, is it actually that ASEAN countries can do to make themselves, uh, let's say, geopolitical resilient or, or, or uh, US or China proof, so to speak? I think it comes back to, uh, it was a comment that's made this morning that 80% um, of the people um, in ASEAN, you know, are, are, are within the sort of SME category in that regard. And I think you know, whether communities, local governments, and even you know, national governments can help to focus on those economies. Because as we said, there is plenty of growth within ASEAN, within the 660 people, that, that has been untapped as yet. And so to facilitate that group, that, 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 those, uh, those companies, to grow locally and then you know, as uh, intra-trade becomes more facilitated within ASEAN is a real key. It's, I think that's one thing that's more in the control. And I, and I mentioned communities because even in communities, there's the ability to, to, to grow within your community if you have that innovation and that entrepreneurial spirit. So facilitating entrepreneurship at grassroots and letting it expand and grow through digital capabilities 
which then brings in the skills that Quinn Van talks about, there's a lot that can be done locally. That shields you so, from outside forces. And then you can take advantage of external trade as, as you like. You're, you know, that, that's in more of your control. But being so dependent upon it, you're, you're less in control of your own destiny. And so actually, destiny is almost in con the control of grassroots businesses. Excellent, and that's a beautiful point to, uh, to end on. I want to thank again uh, both of uh, the speakers uh, today, uh, Quinn Van and David. And of course, you can get the report. I believe we have a one-pager here uh, for everyone uh, that talks about the main findings of the report. And then there's the whole report, which is available in digital form, because it would be a little bit of a waste of paper if we uh, printed that uh, in thousands. Uh, it's a wonderful report um, that you can get from PwC. Thank you all for being here and thanks to my guest.